Welcome to the fourth episode in the Roads to Law interview series. Uh, my name is Rahul Bajaj and I am an MPhil in law student here at the University of Oxford. Today we are joined by a very special guest, uh, Leonard Hubert or Lord Hoffman. Uh, Lord Hoffman was born in Cape Town in South Africa in 1934. Uh, he is a, a retired British judge of South African descent. He came to Oxford in 1957 as a Rhodes Scholar, where he studied law at Queen's College. Then after teaching law at University College and practicing for 13 years, uh, he became a judge and served on the High Court of Justice Chancery Division as a Lord Justice of Appeal. And then finally for 15 years as a Law Lord in the House of Lords. Uh, Lord Hoffman has had an outsized influence in, um, in, in, in the evolution of such areas of law as contract law, company law, and patent, patent law and tort law. So thanks very much at the outset for joining us today, Lord Hoffman. Uh, yes. Uh, my, my first question to you is, uh, I, I would like to begin with your childhood and um, ask you about uh, growing up in Cape Town in South Africa. You've noted in a previous interview that you grew up during the Second World War and how in Cape Town battleships and cruise ships would often pass the city. Uh, you, you know, you, you recalled in that interview that you gave to the Singapore Law Review how you would often go up to the tug operators and ask that you be taken for a ride and brought back to the harbor. Would you therefore say that you had an idyllic childhood and are there any other memories uh, that particularly stand out to you from that period? Well, I don't think I'd uh, describe it as idyllic. I mean, the fact that I spent weekends going down to the docks and hitching lifts on tugs and that sort of thing entirely on my own uh, suggests that I was rather a lonely child. Um, mm -hmm. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you, yes. And um, I think one of, one of the problems I had as a child was that I, at, at school, I was mm -hmm. nearly, nearly two years younger than most of the people in my class. And therefore, from the social point of view, I found it difficult to make friends with them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, you were saying? No, I was just saying that uh, I, I wouldn't adopt the word idyllic to describe my childhood in Cape Town. Right, right, right. Uh, so I mean, it was perfectly, perfectly comfortable existence. Right, right. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and you also noted in that interview that you found school boring, uh, which I found interesting given that, um, you, I mean, your profile clearly indicates uh, that you possess an insatiable love for learning. So I'm just wondering how, if you could, you, you talked about uh, how you were two years, uh, how there was an age gap of two years between you and your peers. Were there any other things in your school and college life that uh, particularly, uh, that have held you in good stead ever since? Any lessons that you learned during that period of living in Cape Town? No, um, I, I, my recollection of, of school in uh, Cape Town uh, was that uh, although I, I might have been uh, capable of uh, absorbing various forms of culture and reading books and so forth, nobody at the school encouraged me to do so. I can't remember anyone suggesting that I read a book that was not on the syllabus or that I look at a picture or that I listen to a piece of music, none, none, none of those things at all. It was just simply a relentless slog through the school uh, syllabus. So I really only discovered uh, the life of the mind, so to speak, uh, when I got to Oxford. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, so my next question to you is about uh, coming to, before you came to Britain in the 1950s, how, what you made of the political situation in South Africa at the time. Uh, proper apartheid, as I understand it, had still not been enforced in South Africa at that point in time. So what did you make of the political situation then? Well, I think as a child and growing up at school, I simply accepted 
the situation as it was. Nothing struck mm -hmm. me particularly odd about it. That was what I'd grown up with. Uh, it was only, I think, again, when I came to Oxford, uh, and I came incidentally in 1954, not, not 1957. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, it's only when I came to Oxford that I realized that this was altogether wrong, uh, the, the situation in South Africa. And uh, <clears throat> when, when I got back to Cape Town in 1957, because I was there for two years between 57 and the beginning of 60, uh, yeah. I, I um, uh, then took more of an interest in local politics. My, uh, my fiancée, as she then was, and I joined the, liberal, the local Liberal Party. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we took an interest in politics and in, in uh, trying to, to alter the situation there. Uh, but before anything further happened, we came to England. Right, right. And uh, how, how was that experience for you of coming to England as a Rhodes Scholar, um, you know, particularly as an immigrant um, and, and, and coming to Oxford? Like, are there any sort of particular memory that you have about how, how the transition was? Well, it was, it was delightful. It was an opening up of the mind. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I came across people who were able to talk about things which I'd never come across before. Uh, mm -hmm. they, they read weekly newspapers and they listened to music and so on. And it was a completely new experience. Right. And when you went down as a Rhodes Scholar after your uh, time of studying in Oxford got over, what did you regard, if any, your mandate to be as a Rhodes Scholar? And how has that impacted the rest of your career and life ever since? Well, I think not, not in the sense that Mr. Rhodes intended. Um, mm -hmm. Mr. Rhodes' idea, I think, was of getting people to come uh, from America and, and the, uh, the Empire uh, to Oxford was that they would go back home and they would be centers of British influence in those places. Uh, yeah. but I, didn't, I decided I wasn't going to go back to South Africa. Uh, it didn't seem there was any future for me there, uh, both uh, because uh, of the political situation. Uh, I thought that there was bound to be a change in which uh, there wouldn't really be a career for white people. And also because I was a Jew, and, at, and the, 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 the then nationalist government uh, weren't particularly in favor of having them in positions of office. So they, they didn't seem to be much of an opening. Right. And did you face, uh, how were you received by uh, the English people uh, as a South African when you came here? And, and, if, and if you're comfortable sharing, did you uh, face any prejudice, uh, any prejudice of, of any kind when you came here? No, I can't recall any prejudice at all. In fact, uh, the people I met, the English, were extremely warm and welcoming. And uh, my only regret, I think, is that I didn't uh, take more of an advantage of the hospitality which people were willing to offer to students from the Commonwealth at that time. Right, right. My next question has, to a large extent, been answered by you already, and, and that was whether you had made, uh, whether you made a conscious decision before coming to England or during your time in England that you wanted to stay on permanently here rather than go back to South Africa or if it was something that happened by accident and you're clearly saying that it was uh, the former because of the two reasons that you gave. It, well it was it was because uh, basically um, my fiance and afterwards my wife um, yeah she and I decided that uh, A, there didn't seem to, the future in South Africa seemed to be fairly bleak, and secondly, that living in England was much more interesting than living in Cape Town. And so we went back to South Africa for our, uh, our marriage, our wedding, in, uh, towards, the, towards the end of 1957. Uh, and uh, then there was a bit of slippage because we had a baby. Uh, right. but we then came back to England early in '60. Mm -hmm. and have never looked back. Never left, yes. <laughs> yes. Uh, so my next question to you is uh, about studying the BCL 
at Oxford. So rumor has it that you did so well in your BCL final exam that not only did you win the Vinerian scholarship, but were in fact personally congratulated by the examiners. Uh, is this true? No, I've got no recollection of that happening. Okay, so it is uh, perhaps uh, sort of an apocryphal tale then. And uh, do you have, uh, how did studying at Oxford um, more broadly help shape the lawyer that you eventually became? Oh, I think that we were very uh, lucky in the people who were teaching law uh, at Oxford at the time. Mm -hmm. um, Herbert Hart, for example, who uh, lived in the house opposite where I had my digs in, in my second year and mm -hmm. people like uh, Rupert Cross, the professor of Maudlin, who'd written a book on evidence, which I afterwards got interested in. And, and he was blind too, if I'm not mistaken. He was blind, yes, he was. Yes, yes. He had yes. a prodigious, prodigious memory, perhaps you have too, so that, that's probably a... <laughs> and uh, and um, John, John Morris of the Conflict of Laws, who was teaching at Maudlin, they were all wonderful people. And um, I think that uh, it was they, really, who got me interested in the law as, a, as an intellectual study. Right. I mean, a lot of, a lot of uh, there are a lot of people at the bar who are extremely good at what they do, but they're not in the least interested in the law. They're interested in, you know, the facts and how you present them and that sort of thing. Um, mm -hmm. I actually was interested in law. Yeah, as, as an intellectual discipline rather yeah. than just sort of an instrument to win yeah. cases and such. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Right. And uh, a lot of people, when they come to Oxford, experience uh, you know, a certain amount of self-doubt. Uh, did you also have to deal with that or would you say that you had a high degree of self-confidence when you came here? I don't remember thinking either of those ways at all. I probably haven't got enough imagination. But uh, I just simply uh, you know, got on with whatever it is I was supposed to be doing, either well or badly, as the case may be. But I didn't trouble about it. Right. So uh, you were called to the bar from Grey's in, in 1964, um, and, and, and you practiced law for 13 years. And during that period, for, for, for some amount of that time, you were also a tutor at University College uh, between 1961 and 1973. Rumor has it that you would often be so busy uh, uh, because of all the things that you were doing that you would conduct your tutorials in the train from Oxford to London. Uh, can, can you describe... Sorry? I've, no, I've, I've often heard that rumor and there's absolutely no truth in it at all. Um, okay, so my, my it, sources have clearly... It's, <laughs> it's perfectly true that uh, uh, often I had to, uh, well, I don't know often, but from time to time, I had to ring up my wife from London and say, can you please ask so-and-so, will he come for his tutorial tomorrow instead of this afternoon or something like that because I'm stuck in London over something or other. Um, yeah. But yeah. Uh, no, there was actually, I, I remember there was supposed to be uh, a tutor at Christchurch uh, called Grant Bailey, who did give tutorials on the train. Uh, but I think it's been that he's been confused with, uh, with me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I see. Uh, and uh, more broadly, can, can you reflect on how the transition from the academy to practicing law was for you in terms of the, in terms of the kind of intellectual engagement you had, the routine that you followed, the deliverables that were expected of you? Well, uh, the, the odd thing was that it was a condition of my fellowship at UNIV, uh, which I think had been founded in, in the 1820s, um, mm -hmm. that I should get myself called to the bar. Right. So I, I duly wrote the bar exams sometime in 64, I think, and, and mm -hmm. got myself uh, called to the bar. And mm -hmm. I then uh, asked... Uh, another unit of uh, man who was at the Chancery Bar called Paul Baker, who was after mm -hmm. the editor of the Law Court Review. Uh, I said, could you, I had a, a, a sabbatical leave coming up. And I yeah. said, could, could he, uh, during my sabbatical leave, get somebody, would he be my pupil master in mm -hmm. at, at his chambers in London? Mm -hmm. And he said, no, but I will find somebody else who will. Yeah. And so, uh, he um, uh, arranged for me to be pupil to Mr. Jeremiah Harmon, who then was 
junior member of the bar and afterwards a judge and, mm -hmm. and uh, a formidable advocate. Uh, and I learned a lot from him, both how to do cases in court and also to some extent how not to do cases in court. Um, because he, he was, uh, had, had a sort of overflow of emotions from time to time. Uh, mm -hmm. That's how I got into it. Uh, and also the, the, I had the, the, the problem that I, although I was, enjoyed teaching, I didn't have yeah. any sort of great academic project in mind. And mm -hmm. I felt that if I was, uh, went to the bar and um, had to be in court on Thursday and so forth, I would have a better reason for getting up in the morning than I had at the time. So that really is a bit of self-discipline too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. But did, uh, did your lifestyle change significantly uh, when, when you started practicing and kind of moved away from teaching? Well, it moved gradually, you see. I mean, I started dabbling in practice after I'd done my pupillage with Harmon in mm -hmm. uh, 65, I think it was, that I did that. Yeah. And then as one does at the bar, uh, I gradually got more and more cases and I had to spend yeah. more and more time in chambers. And so eventually I came to the conclusion I really wasn't doing either job very well. And uh, mm -hmm. it would be better if I resigned my fellowship and made a clean break and went to the bar. I was enjoying right. the bar. Right, right. So you became a judge uh, in the High Court of Justice, uh, a Chansey judge in 1985. Uh, and again, I mean, this is another rumor that I've been told of, which may again be incorrect, which, which is that you used to prepare draft judgments uh, before you came to court and then sometimes alter them based on whichever submissions by counsel you found persuasive. Um, well, is there some truth to that? There is some truth in that. Um, okay. uh, the, if, if you're sitting, at the, a lot of the judgments one gave, at any rate in those days, I don't know whether it's still true, were given extempore, and mm -hmm. um, it, quite often uh, it did to it helped to prepare one's notes as to what your judgment was going to be uh, in yeah. advance, so that as soon as counsel stopped his address, you could launch straight away into your into your judgment, and that, that involved your sort of making notes as to how you thought you would decide the case. But of course, as you said. Um, subject to your being willing to revise them if you found that the argument on the other side was more persuasive. Right. And uh, so, uh, in addition to serving as a chancery judge, as I said in the introduction, you served as a Lord Justice of Appeal and then as a Law Lord. Were there any qualitative differences that you noticed between these three roles? And also, can you share any unique challenges that each role posed for you? Well, the the, um, uh, the big difference, of course, was that uh, once you got into the Court of Appeal and then afterwards to the House of Lords, uh, you didn't see any ordinary people. You only saw lawyers. The people yeah. made, you know, they, they made submissions. And I quite enjoyed uh, hearing witnesses uh, give evidence, mm -hmm. having to make, make up my mind to what extent they were telling the truth and that kind of thing. And that, yeah. that's a, a, a pleasure which I've recovered over the last 10 years, in which I've been practicing as, an, as a commercial arbitrator. And of mm -hmm. course, there again, it's like sitting as a judge of first instance. You, uh, uh, you, you see actual people uh, giving evidence. On the other hand, obviously, in the Court of Appeal, and very much so in the House of Lords, you have more interesting legal problems. As a judge of, judge of first instance, you're not there to decide legal questions. Nobody cares what you think about the law. You've got to follow what other people have said in the Court of Appeal or the House of Lords. But uh, mm -hmm. once you get up there, uh, you can participate in actually um, making the law yourself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And right. of course, as an ex-academic, that was something which appealed to me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The intellectual challenge of yes. kind of shaping the direction of the law. Yes. Ah, uh, right. Uh, so my, my next question to you is, uh, you also noted in the Singapore Law Review uh, sort of interview that I referenced earlier that um, sort of when you were practicing law, the one judge who you really looked up to was Lord Templeman um, and, and, and he was the kind of judge you wanted to become. So I guess my question has two parts to it. One is sort of what were the qualities that he possessed which particularly struck you and then looking back now in hindsight, to what extent were you able to emulate them? 
Well, I, I hope I was. I mean, what I admired about, about Sidney Templeman uh, was that uh, he would engage with you in conversation about what, about the case. He understood. Yeah. He, he picked up immediately and understood what you were saying. He either mm -hmm. agreed with you or he disagreed with you. If he disagreed with you, he told you why he disagreed with you. And it was a bit like more like a university seminar. You argued the thing over the, over the bench. Uh, he had he had no, no pretensions of any kind. If you told him you thought he was wrong, he didn't take offence at that. Yeah. Uh, so um, that, that seemed to me the right way to go about things. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he was a very intelligent man. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, so my next question is a slightly you know uh, deeper, I guess, intellectual question about uh, sort of how cases. How, how judges and lawyers generally approach the cases before them. And it's like this. So sometimes the legal analysis in a case suggests a conclusion uh, that may be different from what one might describe as the merits of the case or more informally as the moral intuitions of a judge. Um, in that situation, how can a lawyer persuade the judge to arrive at the conclusion that is dictated by the legal analysis? In other words, how can, what can an advocate do to ensure that the judge does not first kind of arrive at the conclusion and then reason backwards to find an analytical route to get there? Well, I'm not sure that uh, the advocate counsel uh, can do much more about it than uh, he would normally do in any sort of case, and that is to explain to the judge as clearly and persuasively as possible that that's what he thinks is the law, and what the judge might be thinking of uh, deciding would not be in accordance with what the law requires. Um, mm -hmm. with, with the, uh, with, with the, as far as the judge is concerned, naturally people have their views as to what they think would be a fair answer, what they think would be a just and right answer. And I think you start with the uh, assumption uh, that the law is not likely to be something which requires you to produce a stupid answer. Uh, and so you therefore uh, uh, um, try to analyze the law and see whether there's a rational way of presenting it, which would give you what you think to be a sensible and right answer. Uh, mm -hmm. The question is, can you do it or not? It's very, very seldom. I, I can't remember. Well, with, with one one exception that I'll come to in a moment. Mm -hmm. But uh, I I can't really remember much of having to say, well, I'm afraid that's the law, and I know it's a terrible result, but I'm you know that's that's what I'm going to have to decide. Mm -hmm. When I said that, um, that there were ones which. Um, uh, didn't perhaps quite fit that. Uh, yeah. I'm thinking of, um, in, we had in the Privy Council uh, a number of appeals of, mm -hmm. from, from capital cases in the, in the Caribbean. Now, yeah. the, the Caribbean islands, uh, they had the death penalty, and there was no doubt about it, that was the law there. Uh, and uh, Occasionally, there would be uh, cases which came up before us in which perhaps some of my colleagues saw an opportunity to present the law in such a way that it did not permit the particular person in question to be hanged or whatever. Uh, and uh, there were occasional disagreements over that, and in particular, one or two cases in which I felt that uh, the uh, solution which my colleagues had arrived at, however praiseworthy, in, wanting to avoid uh, somebody's execution. And of course, there was nobody on, nobody on the uh, Privy Council who was in favor of capital punishment. We all thought it was yeah. be terrible. But the answers which sometimes were presented seemed to me to be really not intellectually honest. And uh, there were occasional divisions of opinion over that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the US, I suppose this is a particularly uh, hot button issue because the Supreme Court is often thought of as being split on five, four liberal conservative lines and that then results in the creation of some amount of, um, uh, some amount of, I guess, um, skepticism in the lawyers about the 
the whole notion of trying to convince a judge to arrive at the legally right conclusion. Uh, if, which, if, which, which five or four case were you thinking of? I mean, over a series of uh, like a number of years in the areas of abortion, sort of same sex rights. Oh, this, you talk about the Supreme Court in the United States. Y yes, in the US, I'm saying. Yes, in the US. Exactly. It, yeah. 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 So, so, there, I think this is a particularly pronounced problem, uh, you know, that, that the court tends to sort of judges are believed to have their minds firmly made up and then try to reason backwards sometimes. Well, it's, yes, it's, uh, it's very, I think uh, there's a great difference between the position of the judges in the Supreme Court of the United States and our judges here, because uh, mm -hmm. for, for better or for worse, the United States Constitution and the way its political system works has yeah. uh, uh, put before the judges of the Supreme Court uh, questions of social policy like abortion, capital punishment, uh, same sex, racial discrimination, all that sort of thing, uh, okay. which would never come before a court in this country because they have all been dealt with by a political settlement of one kind or another. There's an abortion okay. act, the Racial Discrimination Act, they, you know, all that, uh, the Sex Discrimination Act. None of that goes on, on a sort of fundamental basis to the court. And so, in, in that respect, we're far better off than the judges in the United States who have this terrible burden of having to lay down social policy. And you can't really complain if you feel that, well, they're doing it according to what they think is the right social policy. They feel that that's what they're there for. Mm -hmm. That's the very nature of the enterprise. But yes. Yes. Uh, my next question to you is, in addition to clearly binding legal principles and authority, so basically precedent, were there any other, looking back, generalizable factors uh, in your jurisprudence that you think tipped the scales in favor of one side in the cases that came before you? Well, the f factor which I often found interesting was the, the boundary line between what is suitable for judicial decision and what is best left to democratic decision. Uh, I mean, mm -hmm. to, to give a, um, a, a, a very sort of simple, crude example, we mm -hmm. had an appeal in the we had an appeal in the House of Lords as to whether, under some public health act, uh, going back to the middle of the nineteenth century, uh, a tenant in a uh, council house in Birmingham was entitled to require that the council. Uh, install a, a wash basin in the loo. Now, mm -hmm. you know, nothing could be sort of more down to earth than, than that. Mm -hmm. uh, but the issue, as I saw it, really was uh, should judges say, yes, the councils have got to install wash basins in their loos, because this would have applied across the country. Uh, or is that a matter which ought to be left to democratic decision as to how councils spend their money? Uh, and uh, that, it's that kind of uh, consideration about the boundaries of democratic decision, which I found extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. And do you generally now, or perhaps even then, uh, did you have the tendency of reflecting on your judgments a great deal after they had been delivered, or were you in the habit of sort of delivering the judgment and then moving on? No, one delivered the judgment and moved on. Occasionally, of course, afterwards, uh, there would be, uh, um, be uh, some other case which made you regret what you had said on the previous occasion, or made you feel that you hadn't expressed yourself clearly enough. Um, that that that, yeah. that occasionally happened. But I, once you'd given the judgment, I didn't sort of go on with a kind of further pondering over what the case was, how I should have decided it. Right. And so that, that's, that, that might be a nice segue for me to ask this question, which was sort of last in my list of questions, but would be more appropriate here. Were there any cases, were there any judgments that you delivered that you've kind of now come to regret? Um, I can't think of any of that. I think I got the wrong answer. I can think mm -hmm. of times in which I thought that I, I uh, didn't express my reasons very well. And of course, that's the main problem with writing judgments in the House of Lords. It's usually quite easy to arrive at the right answer. But, but uh, 
to uh, give your reasons in a way that doesn't mess things up for future cases. That, that is really the problem. Uh, I mean, one, one of the cases, for example, was a patent case by Ajahn and Madiba. Uh, yes. We had back in 1995. And yeah. in that, uh, the judgment I gave in that case uh, didn't express myself very well. In fact, I think that the, uh, the way I put it was wrong. And okay. that caused a certain amount of trouble afterwards and had to be corrected actually by me in the Court of Appeal. I was yes. sort of doing duty in the Court of Appeal at the time. And then, yes. on, then affirmed by the House of Lords uh, to say, no, um, uh, it should have been put in a different way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, I remember attending your lecture uh, for the undergraduate law students at, at Oxford where you shared, where yes. you talked about this. Yes. Uh, um, so my next question to you is that you identified in this interview that you gave, in the, which was published in the Singapore Law Review, the three main qualities that you particularly admire in, 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 in good lawyers, which is in good oral advocates, I suppose, um, which is clarity of exposition, knowledge of the case and simplicity. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if you can share any concrete illustrations of complex cases that came before you, which were uh, explained to you by counsel with particular simplicity and clarity and may serve as a model worth emulating for the young lawyers listening to you? Oh, no, I find it difficult to think of a particular example now. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Uh, then perhaps it would be good to hear you just expand a little on these three qualities that you uh, particular that, that you kind of identified here. Would you would you mind doing that? Well, uh, you, if you you've got to get yourself properly organised. You've got to first of all thought very clearly about what your case is, which points you're going to rely upon. Uh, you want to avoid, uh, if at all possible. Uh, making bad points just as, as make weights, things which you think might fly, uh, but mm -hmm. which, which really uh, only take up time and, and irritate, the, irritate the tribunal. And you, you've got to uh, understand what your case is about. I have a, a philosopher friend who always said, if you can't express yourself clearly, you don't understand it yourself. And mm -hmm. uh, th 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 that is, that's certainly the case. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah, it's perhaps the best lawyers are actually able to practice that rather than just understanding it theoretically, that, that notion. Um, uh, so the, the other thing that you said in that interview was also that the two, uh, so, so some examples that you gave of lawyers who you particularly admired were Jonathan Sumption and David Panic, and you said that their gift was the ability, is the ability to tell a, sh a story within a short span of time yes. um, so so what I'm wondering is if this is something that you think can be developed over a period of time or uh, and can be cultivated or is it something that you think some people naturally possess because I found the use of the word gift there interesting yes well I'm sure that a certain amount of self-discipline can improve your presentation if you, you know sit back and think well is that is that really uh, something which the judge is going to understand? Um, can I express it slightly differently in a way which will be clearer? Uh, I'm sure that you know you've got to put put quite a lot of work into it. Uh, but I, I dare say it's also uh, in, in in the true sense a gift as well. Some people are better at it than others. There's nothing you can do about it. Right. So it's a combination of both. Yeah. Ah. Uh, my next question to you is to what extent do you think can advocacy change the outcome of a case as opposed to the reasoning that is deployed by the judge concerned in, a, in arriving at the outcome? And can you think of any cases in which uh, the advocacy, i.e. the way a case was put to you, uh, changed the outcome? Oh, yes. I mean, I can think of cases in which I went into court and thought, oh yes, well, the answer is this, uh, having read the, the pleadings and the papers and so forth beforehand. And uh, counsel has then persuaded me that that was quite wrong. Uh, I, I remember a particular occasion in the Court of Appeal, 
in which uh, I had a meeting beforehand with my two colleagues, and um, we both agreed that the appellant had to lose. Uh, and uh, uh, this was on, on a question of European law. And mm -hmm. we went into court, and after about 20 minutes or so, counsel for the appellant persuaded me that he was quite right and that he wasn't going to lose, shouldn't lose at all. Uh, it was much more, much more difficult to, uh, to get my two colleagues to swing round. They, they obstinately mm -hmm. adhered to their, their previous view. And eventually, uh, they decided uh, not only that I, writing it, I wrote a dissenting judgment, not only that uh, I was wrong, but mm -hmm. it, I was so obviously wrong that it wasn't a matter which needed to be referred to the European Court in Luxembourg uh, as mm -hmm. one has to do if there has one has to do if there's any doubt about a question of European law. Anyway, mm -hmm. that was that was their view. Thank goodness the House of Lords thought differently, and so it, uh, it did go off to Luxembourg. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I see. So my next question to you is, so the legal business magazine once described you as the most influential uh, person in the House of Lords by a mile. Uh, and, and, and it's well known that you were able to exercise a significant amount of influence, perhaps not in the example that you just gave, but more generally on your judicial colleagues in the House of Lords. Um, so can you share uh, with us any insights on how you were able to persuade them and kind of make them see your uh, sort of bring them around to your perspective on the cases that came that, that you were a part of well that's not really for me to say uh, but um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, no doubt that uh, if you're sitting on a multiple member court, like the Court of Appeal 3 or the House of Lords 5 or more, uh, mm -hmm. you are uh, all the time exercising advocacy on your colleagues. Yeah. If you sit there and, and counsel is putting forward an argument and you ask counsel a question, the question is very often not because you want an answer from counsel, but because you want to signal your point of view to your colleagues sitting around you. So that's, that's, that's one, uh, uh, one way in which you can influence your colleagues. And the other way I thought I found quite useful was that um, if you write a draft of your judgment quickly and mm -hmm. select it then, it's likely to be more influential than if your colleagues have already committed themselves to paper by the time you try to get them around to a different point of view. Mm -hmm. So get in first with your point of view. Right, right. Being, being sort of having that first mover advantage. Yeah. Yes. Um, so my next question to you is: uh, After retiring from the House of Lords, you taught intellectual property law at Queen Mary University and then at the University of Oxford, as I uh, sort of briefly alluded to uh, uh, in response to your Biogen point. Yeah. Um, so, so my uh, my question to you is: In the area of intellectual property law. You delivered a number of judgments during your tenure as a as a judge. For example, on the House of Lords, you referred to Biogen and Kieran Amgen, and also you, you laid down the improver formulation as a Chancery judge uh, in 1990, I think. Um, so, can you reflect on what you think? Uh, I mean, of course, commentators and other judges will have different views, but in your own opinion. What your most sem what your seminal contribution was in the area of intellectual property law in terms of any judgments, approaches, methods, or principles that you laid down? Well, my my, my uh, contribution in on um, patent law has been on the whole a failure. Um, the okay. I, I've already explained that uh, I thought that the uh, <clears throat> the Biogen case, while rightly decided, uh, could have been expressed better. Uh, the mm -hmm. House of Lords has recently decided that the uh, rules for interpretation of patent specifications in Kieran Amgen were wrong. Um, that's the Warner Lambert case that you were thinking. That's right. Yes. The, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, the, that same judgment also makes it clear that they thought that um, uh, improver was wrongly decided and, and that uh, ought to, it, we ought to have decided that, or I ought to have decided that. Um, uh, the the other uh, uh, 
machine for taking hair off ladies' legs uh, was a, 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 an equivalent of the one which mm -hmm. was patented and that therefore it was an infringement. So um, I think my, my contribution to intellectual property is at a low ebb at the moment. Mm -hmm. But then would you say that it's because you decided your cases wrongly, uh, you decided these cases wrongly or has the current court taken the wrong view? Well, I'm, I was pleased to see that the, um, the Singapore Court of Appeal, in what I thought was rather a good judgment, uh, said that uh, they thought that Kieran Amgen was still right and that the Warner Lambert case was wrong and that they weren't going to follow the Warner Lambert case. So I was encouraged by that. But yes, I do. I still think that I was right, but there it is. Uh -huh. And were there any particular challenges in adjudicating on IP disputes that you confronted sort of as, as distinct from other areas of law? Um, the, the, the main challenge in, uh, on, the, on those patent cases uh, was uh, understanding the, uh, the science involved, uh, which I thought was quite fun. But um, uh, in fact, one of the reasons why I got involved in it, which was really only starting in the Court of Appeal in the House of Lords, I mean, apart from the Improver case, I had no patent cases as a judge and I had no patent practice at the bar. Uh, mm -hmm. But um, uh, my colleagues, on the other hand, were absolute technophobes who um, were terrified at the notion of having to understand any form of scientific uh, um, <coughs> scientific content in the case. And so uh, I sort of picked it up because nobody else wanted it. Uh, mm -hmm. But I, I rather enjoyed the, uh, the, 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 you know, discovering about DNA and how that worked and all that kind of thing. Right, right, right. So, so your openness of mind in, 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 in understanding these issues more is kind of what you think sort of set you apart in, in, in those contexts. Yeah. Uh, okay, my next question is on a slightly different uh, issue entirely. Um, and, and it is about, uh, again, a kind of picking up on something that you, that you noted in this interview that you uh, uh, never felt overworked even in the House of Lords when you were about to retire. Uh, and at the same time, you also said that you never cancelled a, a single social engagement while you practice law or while you were on the bench. So, I mean, it, it's well known that in the legal profession, a lot of lawyers uh, particularly deal with mental health challenges and work-related stress is a huge issue. Um, so this being so, what guidance would you have for them in being able to maintain a sense of proportion? Well, I think one of the advantages of being at the bar or on the bench uh, is that you're not, uh, you're not working for anybody. It's very different mm -hmm. from being a, a lawyer in a, a large city firm or something like that in which you're part of a team, you're being ordered about, you, you have to do this by tomorrow morning and, and so forth. Um, it's not like that at the bar. And mm -hmm. you, can, you can run your practice or run your decisions as a judge uh, more or less to your own timetable. So um, we have advantages which other lawyers don't. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but like given that, uh, in terms of, uh, do you think still that there, there are steps that they can take in based on your experience of kind of being able to maintain a, a, a sense of proportion, like in terms of people that you may have worked with over a period of time, who were able to do their work with, uh, with, with, with in, in like better, better mental health compared to others. Were there any trends that you noticed? Trends? Yeah, hmm. trends, like in terms of people who got burnt out quite quickly. Well, I think some people worry more than others, that's all. And, um, uh, I, I didn't find that I got wound up or anxious over things, at least not, not particularly often or very much. Right. But that's, again, that's, I imagine that's just simply genetics. Right. So uh, uh, one observation that you made in an interview that you gave in the uh, uh, Market and Financial Law Review, if I'm getting the name right, was that you said, uh, as an immigrant from the colonies, I am a great admirer of the continuity of English institutions. 
I think one of the great assets of this country is that the past appear, uh, the past reaches out to you in a way that it does not in many other countries. And you also noted how in England, uh, uh, what you find is a combination of contempt. Uh, contemporary practicality as well as ancient pedigree. So, can you can you explain why you think this way? Well, I think that um, the, the past and people's um, uh, understanding of what the past is, right or wrong, and quite often wrong, but nevertheless, mm -hmm. whatever it is, uh, gives them a sense of national identity. I mean, for example, when when we had the uh, celebration of the anniversary of Magna Carta in uh, 2015, which I think was the 800th yes. anniversary. 800, yes. There was a lot of stuff about you know, how Magna Carta was the foundation of our democracy and all that sort of thing. And that's what most people think. Well, it, it probably isn't, historically, it probably isn't true. And Jonathan Sumption wrote a uh, talk in which he explained why it wasn't true, but it doesn't matter. The point is, it's that sort of thing, that feeling that they, that the past reaches out to them, the feeling that uh, that, that uh, they are part of a continuity going back into the Middle Ages, that there's never been in this country a, a year zero in which we started again um, and had you know, adopted a new constitution or anything like that. That's what gives people a sense of national identity, and that's a valuable thing to have. Mm -hmm. And then my last question to you uh, is, is, is this. So in the last, and you mentioned Jonathan Sumption now, uh, just now, you've been engaged in the last few years with Lord Sumption uh, in a debate about the correct method uh, to the task of contractual interpretation that courts should adopt. Uh, you, you responded to his Harris Society lecture in an article that you wrote in the Law Quarterly Review called Language and Lawyers. Um, so what I'm wondering is, uh, in, in the 2017 uh, case of Wood versus Capita Insurance, the Supreme Court speaking through Lord Hodge said that textualism and contextualism are not mutually exclusive and they are, they, 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 there isn't like a uh, sort of a, a, you know, an ongoing battle between them for which method should prevail in the task of contractual interpretation, but that they can both coexist. Um, given this, do you think that um, the differences that exist between the two of you are only differences of degree uh, at best rather than differences of kind. No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, uh, a wooden capital is fine. Uh, I, I, I can quite see that there are arguments in, from case to case about whether you ought to give more prominence to the language which is being used or to what extent you ought to be influenced by the surrounding circumstances and so on and so forth. And there are sort of swings back and forth over that. Uh, my objection to Jonathan is that he's a fundamentalist. He believes, and he said in the, in the lecture, uh, that there ought to be a, a conclusive presumption that words have been used in the conventional method, however much the context may show that they, the parties must have got it wrong. And it's that, it's that fundamentalism that I object to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so you think Wood versus Capital Insurance was only on its own facts, but the broad disagreement, it doesn't really resolve it um, as some people think it may have helped to, to an extent. Well, I, I, I don't think that uh, uh, Jonathan's uh, um, uh, thesis that you can have a, um, uh, a legal presumption, that, uh, an irrebuttable presumption, that words must mean what the dictionary says they mean. I don't think that there's any support for it in the authorities or anywhere else. And um, uh, uh, very recently, there was a case in the uh, Supreme Court in which uh, they, they said without any fuss, uh, well, yes, this is what it says, but obviously they got it wrong and it's actually what they meant for something else. That, that, you know, that, that, <laughs> that's unavoidable. It doesn't happen very often because you expect lawyers to use words properly. And uh, cases like um, uh, the, the, the ICS case back in the 90s and uh, the... Um, uh, the would, uh, I guess... Uh, the, the ICS was in, yeah, ICS was in the 90s and then there was... Uh, 97, 
the chart book and persimmon in, in 2009. Yes. These, these sort of cases crop up about once in a decade. Uh, yeah. And um, because, as I say, normally lawyers can be relied upon to, 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 to say, you know, use the language correctly. And also because yeah. there are very limited grounds upon which you can discover from actually just reading the contract and the surrounding circumstances that they must have got things wrong. They very often got get things wrong in a way which is not perceptible from that way, but nevertheless they've got it wrong, and then you need rectification. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, so that brings us then to the end of this conversation. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Lord Hoffman, for taking time out and for providing such thorough and candid answers to all my questions. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly grateful to Niranjan Venkatesan and Thomas Westwell uh, for making some question suggestions that went into the questions I asked you. Uh, if there's anything else that you'd like to talk about, do let us know. But from my perspective, this brings us to the end of the conversation. Well, thank you very much. And very nice to have spoken to you. Yes, thank you.